known as the crown jewel of the North Atlantic. A land of lighthouses, coastal cliffs, marine life of all shapes and sizes, trails both serene and daunting, and the chance to be one of the first to see sunrise in the United States. And I'm taking you to it all at Acadia National Park. This is the Bass Harbor Head Lighthouse, one of the most famous photo locations in Acadia, especially at sunset. We're heading here and to some of the best hikes, sites, and just general things to do in Acadia National Park, including what might be one of the most famous sunrise spots in the country from the top of Cadillac Mountain. And from October until about March, it's the first place in the United States to see sunrise. This would be my third time visiting Acadia, and each time I've driven up here, about an 11 and a half hour ride from my home in Buffalo, New York. For those looking to fly in, the closest airport is the Bar Harbor Airport, though JetBlue through Cape Air is the only major airline to service this one, on some pretty small planes and only during the summer months. Next is the Bangor Airport, just over an hour away, and then the Portland Jetport, three hours driving time to the park. I love the city of Portland and have stopped here on every journey up to Acadia, this latest being no exception. From the famous Portland headlight to the historic downtown and some really incredible breweries, including Shipyard and Allagash, I just couldn't help myself but stop again. Also at Allagash and a few other pop-ups around Portland, is a bite into Maine food truck, said to make some of the best lobster rolls in the entire state. So I gave it a try while enjoying a pint here. And man, was it ever amazing. Worth every penny. I was staying just up the road in Freeport though. It was about a three hour drive from Freeport to Mount Desert Island, the heart of Acadia. Mount Desert Island, is indeed an island and home to Acadia's most popular attractions. The island is comprised of the park and a handful of small towns, hamlets, and of course, Bar Harbor, the largest town found on the island. The park here is a bit all over the place. Created in 1916, first as a national monument and then a national park three years later in 1919, much of the park land on Mount Desert Island was privately owned and donated to the Park Service and its cause, resulting in the patchwork layout. You'll find a variety of hotels, motels, and then privately owned campgrounds on the island, as well as a couple owned by the National Park Service too. I was spending my first night at a privately owned one, the Bass Harbor Campground, found in the southwestern part of Mount Desert Island, this had been my go-to campground on my previous visits, and I wanted to do at least one night here on this trip to explore some of the attractions found around it. This part of Mount Desert is generally quieter than the rest, a welcome relief. You see, as of 2024, Acadia is the seventh most visited park in the entire country. If you plan on coming during the summer or the fall months, Definitely expect some crowds. Bass Harbor is about half an hour from a lot of the park's more popular attractions. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have its own things to see. But first things first, I had to get my camp set up. The nice thing about private campgrounds, especially this one, is they often have more amenities. Hot showers on site, a general store, swimming pool, and so on. I'll drop a link below to the Bass Harbor Campground, in case you're interested in booking a site for yourself. But it's time for our first hike, and spot number one is a perfect introduction to Acadia, the Ship Harbor Trail, just down the road. 1.4 miles long and pretty much flat the entire way, this figure eight shaped trail has a lot of Acadia staples packed into it. From pink granite cliffs, to forest canopies, 
wildlife spotting opportunities, and most of all, tide pools. Yes, you'll want to visit this one near low tide. Link below to local tide times. I recommend some waterproof boots or some kind of a hiking sandal for this one too, if you do plan to go wading. Find the trail just down the road from Bass Harbor. There's a small parking lot and some street parking too. This is part of Acadia National Park, so you'll need to display a valid park pass on your windshield. And they do check. I saw numerous cars with written warnings on them. You can of course use your America the Beautiful Annual Pass, or you'll need to purchase an Acadia Entrance Pass from the Visitor Center, located here. Begin the trail, which starts off in the woods. I mentioned this was a figure eight, but I recommend staying to the right to start, which will bring you along the coast in no time. This quiet cove is home to numerous birds, eagles, osprey, and loons to name a few. If you do feel like doing some tide pooling, take one of the spur trails down onto the rocks, stepping carefully between them, eventually leading you down to the shore where you can take a look. A pair of polarized sunglasses or a camera lens with a polarized filter will help immensely in seeing through the sun's glare on the water. Tread carefully too, and try not to disturb. At first glance, it might seem like just snails, but the closer you look, the more you're bound to see. Once you've seen enough aquatic life, head back to the main trail and continue on. It goes slightly uphill here, and to some classic Acadia cliffs with an open view of the Atlantic. Keep on going, where the trail heads back into the forest and takes you over a few of these raised wooden sections. And wait a minute, what was that? A smooth green snake, also known as a grass snake. And I'm sorry for the surprise, snake haters. Fear not though, this is one of the most harmless and docile snakes there is, and maybe even a little too curious sometimes. Cute, right? I think so at least. Keep an eye out for these guys while hiking in Acadia. Finish the trail off, heading down the other side of the figure eight, which leads through some denser forest before depositing you back at the beginning. Hike number one was in the books. Dinner tonight would have to be quick. I needed to be in position for sunset just down the road. I suppose I lied a little bit earlier. Bass Harbor is not nearly as busy as the rest of the park, but come sunset, people flock for the view of the lighthouse here. Quite literally just down the road from the campground, the parking lot for the Bass Harbor headlight is not that large, and there's absolutely no street parking on the road leading down to it. It fills quickly, and a ranger will block off the road once it's full to prevent anyone else from driving down and getting stuck. Luckily, I brought my bike on this trip, so I used that to make the short trip down. There's two views of the lighthouse, up close by way of a short paved trail directly from the parking lot, which takes you right up to it and gives you some great views of the Atlantic. And then there's probably what's the more famous view, found to the left of the parking lot. Only 0.4 miles round trip, this trail goes through the woods, down a kind of steep staircase, and out under the cliffs. You'll definitely want to wear footwear with good grip. And there it is, an absolutely classic Acadia view. Sunset is prime time here. Expect a crowd, especially of photographers on the lower cliffs. There were just enough clouds in the sky for some extra drama, so I set up for a time lapse, wary of the incoming tide, and this is what I got. Not too bad. I grabbed a few more shots, especially once the light itself turned on. Packed up and made the short ride back, enjoying the sun's last colors along the way. All in all, a pretty successful first day in Acadia. This morning I slept in a little bit, but only a little bit. 
A quick breakfast in me, I packed up and headed off for Acadia hike number three. This is Echo Beach, where we'd essentially be starting our hike from. It's one of two official beaches you can swim at in the park, and the only one that's freshwater. We weren't going hiking on this beach though. Instead, we're hiking to the mountain that it sits at the base of, to the fire tower on top of it. That is, Beach Mountain. And we're taking a slightly longer route, via the Beach Cliff Ladder Trail, which starts down here at the Echo Beach parking lot. A lot of beach. Taking the Beach Cliff Ladder Trail adds a little over a mile round trip to this hike, for a grand total of just under two and a half miles. If you'd like to skip the cliff ladder part and just do Beach Mountain, there's a separate parking lot you can start at, and the trail from there is only 1.2 miles round trip. So why add the extra then? One, so you can go swimming at Echo Beach after the hike. And two, to experience some of Acadia's famous iron rung ladders built into the cliff sides. If you're afraid of heights, maybe this isn't your cup of tea. I had some time to kill before I could check into my next campsite, so I was up for the challenge. I parked at Echo Beach and then started up the Beach Cliff Ladders Trail. It begins fairly normal, wooded and uphill via a series of switchbacks. Echo Lake down below gets gradually smaller the higher you get. Continue on following along the cliffside, and eventually you'll reach the first ladder. Gather your courage and head on up. Not too bad, right? Keep pressing forward, where you're greeted with three more ladders, all in a row and definitely higher than that first one. Only way to go is up. Well, that's not necessarily true, but anyways. Careful footing and good grips on the rungs will see you to the top in no time. Once you've caught your breath, continue on where it finally flattens out for a little bit. Signs direct you, and we're taking the one towards the Beach Mountain parking lot. But first, let's take a look at Echo Lake from these cliffs. Continue towards the Beach Mountain parking lot. This short, forested section of trail will pop you out there in no time. The Beach Mountain Trail is a loop, which starts from the right side of the parking lot. So, begin the trek up. It's only about 360 feet of elevation gain on this trail, and the views of Acadia only get better the higher you are. There is some rocky terrain, but I really wouldn't call it scrambling. It's not too bad. And then in no time, the fire tower up here comes into view. Look for the marker off to your left here, if you'd like. You've reached the top of Beach Mountain. I don't know the exact protocol for this fire tower, but generally, if there's someone living in it, it's up to them if you can come up or not. This time of year, that being July, there was no one here. So it was locked, but you could still go about halfway up the staircase for a better view. You get an absolutely fantastic view of the rolling green hills of Mount Desert Island and Southwest Harbor off in the distance. Once you've taken it all in, head on back down. You can continue the trail and finish the loop or head back down the way you came, which is actually what I did, since I was on a bit of a time crunch. First, I had to try and snag a reservation for a Cadillac Mountain Sunrise. It's one of the most popular areas of the park, and getting a reservation on recreation.gov can be pretty tough. No luck this morning though, but I still had a few more chances. And of course, getting back down to Echo Beach I couldn't help myself but to jump in for a quick swim to cool down after the hike. But now, it was lunchtime. We're headed to one of the most famous places in Acadia. For afternoon tea and popovers, of course. I'm sorry, tea and what now? Hang tight, we'll get there. 
This is Jordan Pond, found pretty much in the center of the park, and home of the bubbles, those two rounded hills off in the distance. And yes, we'll be hiking to the tops of them in just a little bit. Jordan Pond is also home to the Jordan Pond House, a fairly well-known restaurant. Since 1893, diners have been coming here for lunch, namely afternoon tea and popovers. Popovers are essentially light, fluffy muffins made with an eggy batter, served hot with butter and strawberry jam. They're a Jordan Pond House classic. Getting a reservation can be tough, especially during the peak hours of 11.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. You can make reservations up to a month in advance on Open Table, link below. Additionally, you can show up around an hour or so before they open at 11 a.m. and make a day of reservation. Lastly, you can walk up, but expect to wait a while. I arrived a little after 10 a.m., smelling like Echo Lake water, unfortunately, but was able to make an 11.30 a.m. reservation. Do arrive at least half an hour before your reservation time if you're driving in. Parking is extremely limited and turns into outright chaos around lunchtime with folks missing their reservations simply because there's nowhere to park. I could only get indoor seating, but do try for outdoors if you decide to come here. I had a quick lunch of popovers with a cup of lobster stew, and the hype was real about these popovers. They were so good. As for the stew, I didn't think to check market price on lobster and ended up paying $19 for it. It was pretty good, but definitely not $19 good. With lunch over, I took a walk around the Jordan Pond Path, a flat three mile loop that goes around the entire thing. It's a nice easy trail that gives you great views of the pond, the bubbles, and a chance to spot birds that call the area home. We'd be coming back, but now it was time to check in to campsite number two. Acadia has two park-run campgrounds on Mount Desert Island. The Seawall Campground, down near Bass Harbor, and the Blackwoods Campground, closer to the interior of the park. Both can only be reserved online at recreation.gov, two months in advance. I was staying at Blackwoods, hoping to be a little closer to the more popular areas of the park than I had in visits past. It's a simple campground tucked away in a quiet forest. I got my tent set up and all settled in. While there's no services except for bathrooms here in Blackwoods, if you make a right out of the campground entrance, you're pretty much immediately in the small town of Otter Creek, which has 24-7 coin-op showers as well as ice and firewood for sale. I sat down for a quick dinner and to hopefully let the park clear out a bit. The bubbles are a very popular hike, that don't have a large parking lot, so I was hoping that if I visited a little later in the day, it might be a bit less busy. And right I was. There was plenty of parking around 4.30pm. If you'd like to reach the top of both bubbles, it's a 1.6 mile round trip hike and just over 500 feet of elevation gain. So begin the trail heading through the woods and then gradually uphill. It's pretty straightforward to be honest. Just keep your eyes open for the bubbles divide sign, indicating the directions of each bubble. I headed to the right and the north bubble, arguably the steeper and slightly less visited of the two. Make your way up and Jordan Pond below will start to pop out in no time. A mix of rocky steps and gradual switchbacks, it's really not too bad. And then, marked by sign, you're here, the summit of the North Bubble. And what a view, Jordan Pond down below and the South Bubble off to your left and then beyond. Once you've had enough, head back down to the divide and make your way up the South Bubble. I would say this trail is a little easier, with less elevation gain than the north. Simply follow it until you reach the marker here for the peak of the south bubble. But wait a minute, 
There's no real view from here. Don't worry. Go just a little bit past the marker and then it really opens up. From here you have a clear view of Jordan Pond and even the Jordan Pond house off in the distance. A pretty good place to stop and take a break and to simply take it all in. Also, it was pretty hot out still, and man did that water look inviting. Unfortunately, there's no swimming in Jordan Pond since it's used as a source of drinking water. But that doesn't mean you can't go out into it. So I made my way back down the bubbles and to my car. We were heading down to the Jordan Pond boat launch for a sunset paddle. There's four bodies of water the Park Service allows you to paddle on in Acadia. Jordan Pond, Eagle Lake, Echo Lake, and Long Pond. Swimming and paddle boarding are not permitted in Jordan Pond or Eagle Lake. And I don't believe it's permitted in Long Pond, at least the part on Parkland. Echo Lake, on the other hand, does allow swimming and paddle boarding. So, we'd be kayaking Jordan Pond this evening. From the boat launch, I hopped into my inflatable kayak and made my way out. And what a way to see Jordan Pond. I was lucky to be the only person out here, besides this lone loon who was singing his song. I only went about halfway out and simply stopped to enjoy the views and the solitude. Paddling Acadia's ponds and lakes is a great way to see its sights, but there's also another way, besides hiking and driving, to get around the park and to parts of its lesser seen interior. But that we would save for tomorrow. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was a major proponent of Acadia National Park's foundation, and he did not want the park or Mount Desert Island tainted by too many automobiles. His solution? The creation of a network of gravel carriage roads on the eastern side of the island, constructed between 1919 and 1931. Today, this 45-mile network of carriage roads found within the park are open to hikers, bicyclists, and horseback riders. No trip to Acadia is complete without at least exploring a section of its famous carriage roads. So, that's exactly what I plan to do. We're heading to Eagle Lake today, found on the backside of the bubbles in Jordan Pond, by way of my 25-year-old mountain bike and Acadia's carriage roads. I was starting out from the parking lot at the Halls Cove Visitor Center, where you'll find an access point. Access points with car parking can be found throughout Acadia. You're not just limited to starting here at the Visitor Center. And just a heads up for bicyclists, only Class 1 e-bikes are allowed on the roads. So I started off, enjoying the view of the woods from my bicycle, then of Witch Hole Pond. I decided to pull off at Beaver Pond, just a little ways up ahead. What with its abundant lily pads, uh, less than thriving trees in the center, and numerous croaking bullfrogs, it was a great place for a quick break to take it all in. Intersections are marked by sign. You could even take the roads all the way down to Jordan Pond and beyond. But for this trek, we were heading to Eagle Lake. I biked along its western shores for a bit, eventually stopping for a break and a quick snack, and to simply take in the quiet afternoon. While this would be where I'd call it quits for the day, do explore other parts of the carriage road system. Back in 2020, I used the portion of the roads more towards the west to reach and hike the Hadlock Brook Trail to Waterfall Bridge one of the famous stone bridges found along the carriage roads, though the waterfall was a little dry in the middle of the summer. 
They're a fantastic way to get around and see some less busy parts of the park. It's worth noting that there's also a free shuttle bus to get around Acadia, the Island Explorer. You can catch it from the visitor center and it makes stops at various points throughout the park. Link in the description for more information. I'd done a fair bit of hiking, biking, and a little kayaking at this point in my trip, and I was ready for an easier day. So, to kick things off this morning, I was heading into Bar Harbor, the largest town found on Mount Desert Island. Classic New England in style, it's where you'll find a large variety of shops, restaurants, and scenic tours. In the shops here, you'll notice moose, black bears, and puffins all over, well, pretty much everything you can buy. Your chances of seeing a moose in Acadia are pretty much near zero. They like to stick to the mainland. And while there is a small black bear population on Mount Desert Island, you probably won't see any of them either. As for puffins, you actually do have a chance to see some while you're here. Head down to the pier for the Bar Harbor Whale Watching Company. From here, you can book a variety of ocean excursions, the two most popular being whale watching and then the Puffin and Lighthouses tour. Whale watching is the pricier option, and each tour runs around three and a half to five hours. If you don't happen to spot any whales, the company will give you a voucher for another tour, good for up to three years. But on this particular trip, it was all about the puffins. There's a handful of puffin nesting colonies in northern Maine, from May through August at least. The one we're visiting today is found at the island of Petit Manon, also home to Maine's second largest lighthouse. This tour is about three hours long, visiting the puffin colony and a handful of other islands and lighthouses along the way where you'll have the opportunity to spot other wildlife too. A few tips. Bring a jacket. It's colder out on the ocean than dry land. Next, definitely bring a pair of binoculars or a telephoto lens for your camera. Puffins are pretty small, only about the size of a pigeon. Tickets can and should be purchased online in advance. Link below. I arrived around 45 minutes before tour time for check-in. Enough time to get a blueberry donut and coffee from Coffee Hound. Definitely worth it. From there, I headed on down to the pier to get checked in and board the boat. A knowledgeable guide narrates your tour the entire time, pointing out interesting landmarks and any wildlife you might spot along the way. But we were off, heading straight away to Petit Manon and the Puffin Colony. We passed by a handful of islands, lighthouses, and other landmarks along the way, which we would stop at on the return, including the Skudik Peninsula, the quieter part of Acadia National Park found on the mainland. Slowly but surely, Petit Manon and its lighthouse began to come into view off in the distance. The closer you get, you just might begin to spot some puffins flying by. Eventually, the boat pulls up to the island where you can see these amazing birds all over. The boat rotates too, ensuring everyone has a chance to see. Keep your eyes peeled for other wildlife, like these seals who made an appearance. The lighthouse here is pretty impressive. Constructed in 1855, it stands 109 feet tall, and like I mentioned before, is the second tallest in the state of Maine. I was content to snap as many shots of the birds as I could, and grab some footage too. The boat stays here for about 15 to 20 minutes, before bidding the island farewell and heading back towards Bar Harbor. There were still more islands and lighthouses to see. The first even had a pair of nesting bald eagles, and their kiddos, sitting happily in the nest. Next up was the Winter Harbor Lighthouse, just off the coast of the Skudik Peninsula and the town of Winter Harbor. We were fortunate enough to spot some seals here too, and if you're dead set on seeing these blubbery fellows, then the next spot is for you. The Egg Island Lighthouse, 
home to a certainly smaller light, was also home to another pair of bald eagles and countless seals sunning themselves up on the rocks. Just look at all of these guys. The boat takes its time at each of these islands too, so you have ample opportunity to see things. They definitely don't rush you. We stopped at a few more islands, spotted one more bald eagle, and then that was about it. We pulled back into Bar Harbor, and now it was time to explore the town properly. But first, I had to try for a Cadillac Mountain Sunrise permit again. And once again, no luck. I was running out of opportunities now. But anyways, now I was off to explore the town of Bar Harbor. Nestled on a hillside along the coast, Bar Harbor is a charming New England town. Home of quite a few seafood restaurants, pubs, and plenty of shops. I did my fair share of exploring a little bit of shopping, and of course, went to check out the local beer scene. First up was Fog Town Brewing. I was excited to check this one out. I don't recall it being here on my last visit, four years prior. I treated myself to their Family Jam Sour, a hoppier sour primarily brewed with strawberries. Perfect for a hot day here in town. And next up was Bar Harbor's Premier Brewery. Atlantic Brewing Company. This one I had been to before, and you can find their beer all over Mount Desert Island and beyond in Maine. I stopped in for a quick lunch and just a single beer. I actually did have a hike to do here in town in just a little bit, and of course, I treated myself to what I believe is their flagship brew, their blueberry ale. Blueberries are kind of an Acadia staple, and this beer was just perfection. There's actually a part of Acadia National Park pretty much within Bar Harbor itself, but accessing it takes some precise timing. This is Bar Island and the Bar Island Trail, only accessible about 90 minutes before and after low tide. That's right, the trail is just a sandbar that is revealed by the low tide. 1.9 miles round trip from its start on West Street in Bar Harbor takes you across the sandbar and to the lookout on top of Bar Island. And along the way, there are lots of tide pools to explore. Same rules apply as the Ship Harbor Trail. Step carefully and try not to disturb. And like Ship Harbor, you'll want to bring appropriate footwear if you do plan on waiting. Also, be wary of the tide times. It comes in fast, and people have gotten stranded here before. There is a water taxi to rescue you, but it's pricey and can take a while to get there. Otherwise, you have a nine hour wait until the next low tide. I found all manner of interesting sea creatures in these tide pools, including quite a few sea stars, something I didn't see a lot of back at Ship Harbor. But I did want to complete the hike itself, so, I went stomping out of the water and up onto Bar Island. It's a fairly simple trail. It winds through the woods, past an open meadow, and gradually uphill to this opening, where you can see Bar Harbor off across the way. An easy hike, by all accounts, but it had still been a long day and I was ready to turn in. Tomorrow's hike, while short, is arguably one of the most dangerous in Acadia but rewards hikers with some of the best views in the entire park. We already explored one hike with some of Acadia's iron ladders, but there's two that are far more famous and popular. The first is the Precipice, a two mile round trip hike with some vertical portions accessed by iron handrails bolted into the side of the cliffs. Unfortunately on this trip, it was closed due to peregrine falcons nesting on it, generally a yearly occurrence between March and August. But just past it is the next one that we were doing, the Beehive. One and a half miles round trip, it's very similar to the precipice. A mix of iron rungs, vertical ladders, wooden pathways bolted into the cliffside, and some incredible views of the ocean and Mount Desert Island. It's also one of the most popular hikes in the park, 
and is accessed from the parking lot for one of the most popular areas in the park. Sand Beach, which we'll be visiting after hiking the beehive. So I arrived early, parked at Sand Beach, and started getting ready. The beehive was in perfect view from here. Make your way up and out of the parking lot and across the road, where you'll find the beginning of the trailhead. Collect your courage and begin the hike. It's 508 feet of total elevation gain on this one, and a gradual start, leading you through the woods. A warning sign quickly greets you. This hike is not for those with a fear of heights, and unfortunately, yes, people have fallen and been seriously injured here. Just be mindful. Wear boots with good grip, take your time on any iron rungs, and step carefully. And certainly don't hike this one in poor weather either. The trail begins to get steeper and steeper, and Sand Beach begins to come more and more into view. Eventually, you'll reach the first real challenge, this iron pathway built into the cliffside. It's sturdy, I promise. Make your way across and continue on. The path can definitely be narrow, so be careful. And then you come to your first set of iron rungs built into the cliffside. This is pretty much how the rest of the trail is going to be until you reach the top of the mountain. A combination of scrambling, walking along narrow cliff edges, and vertical portions by way of these iron rungs. And then you pop out at the beehive's famous spot. The trail winds around the cliff edge, and there's a wooden portion added to help you get across. Sand Beach and the Atlantic Ocean are looking mighty picturesque down below. It's a popular photo spot too. Expect traffic jams here if you hike later in the day. I was here early, and lucky to have it pretty much to myself. But once you're ready, continue on. We're close now. Make your way around the cliff and you're greeted with the final set of iron rungs. And man, is it vertical here. Head on up, complete a short scramble, and then you'll find yourself at the top of the beehive. Not too bad at all. You get another fantastic view of Mount Desert Island, Sand Beach, and the ocean from up here. Once you're ready, Continue forward, following signs for the bowl. You technically can go back down the way you came, but I definitely don't recommend it. Instead, finish the loop off by essentially hiking down the backside of the mountain and around, which has no ladders or vertical sections. You'll eventually come to the bowl, a large and scenic pond. From here, Follow signs for the bull trail and sand beach parking, which will eventually put you back at the trail's beginning. One of Acadia's toughest hikes now in the books, it was time to take a little break on the beach. Sand beach, of course. A pristine, obviously sandy beach tucked into one of Acadia's coves. In the summertime, this place gets very, very busy. I was glad to take a break here for a bit though and just enjoy the view, including looking up at the now conquered beehive. As for swimming, you certainly can here, but do be warned, the water at Sam Beach never really warms up, maxing out at around 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the summertime. Sand Beach is also a great place to come for stargazing. Acadia has some of the darkest skies you'll find. I highly recommend visiting around a new moon. The Milky Way is absolutely stunning from here. This is a panoramic shot I took from Sand Beach back in 2018. During my most recent trip though, it was a full moon, meaning no Milky Way. 
but there was still an opportunity for some nighttime photography, which I planned to do from a smaller, unique beach just down the road. But I'm getting ahead of myself by a little bit. There's actually another hike that starts from Sand Beach, on the far side of it. Much easier than the Beehive, but still with some fantastic views. This is the Great Head Trail, just over one and a half miles round trip, and around 300 feet of elevation gain. It leads through dense woods, with views of Acadia's cliffs and the Atlantic Ocean. Begin this one at this staircase, like I mentioned, on the far side of Sand Beach. I headed upwards and to the right, favoring the coastal views first. You soon get a view of the beach and beehive from a higher vantage point. But keep going, where it takes you back into the forest for just a little bit. I did stop here for a few minutes. I was lucky enough to spot this pair of woodpeckers busy at work as I was making my way through. Eventually it opens up again, and you get an even better view of sand beach and the beehive. I still had my long lens on from those woodpeckers, and was able to zoom in and spot some hikers making their way up the mountain. It really puts it into perspective from this angle. Keep on trekking forward, and you'll find yourself at the top of the Great Head in no time. You can see quite a bit from here, including the Egg Rock Lighthouse that we went by on the Puffin Tour. You can also see a lot of Acadia's cliff sides from here, another staple feature of the park. And that's exactly where we were headed next. I finished the loop off and made my way back to my car. The one-way Park Loop Road runs parallel to the cliffs for quite a while, and there's ample pull-offs for visitors to stop, get out, and simply explore. A trail runs alongside the road for much of it too. But for the sake of this video, I'm simply going to highlight some key points of interest along the cliffs. And first up is Thunder Hole, an inlet found within the cliffs. This spot is famous for creating massive, thundering sea sprays when water is forced into it. A short trail overlooks and leads hikers right down next to it too. Thunder Hole is marked by sign, and you'll find a parking lot across from it. I parked here and made the short walk over. If you want a chance to see this place in action, you'll want to arrive around 90 minutes before high tide as the water's coming in. You generally still need a bit of luck though, in the form of wind or somewhat choppier seas. On this visit, while I was here about an hour before high tide, the ocean was relatively calm, resulting in some less than exciting thundering. But let's keep going. Next up is a short trail found at the tip of Mount Desert Island called Otter Point. From the parking area here, we're following this one mile round trip trail back upwards towards one of the more prominent cliffs. Otter Cliffs, to be exact. Cross the street and you'll find the trail. It's fairly flat and straightforward the entire way, with plenty of spur trails leading out under the cliffs themselves should you feel like stopping to explore or just taking the views a little bit. But the key feature here is Otter Cliffs themselves, a large and imposing set of Acadia's famous cliffs. The drop from here is significantly higher than anywhere else on this hike. It's also possible to rock climb here too. But we were wrapping up our time on the Parks Loop Road, with just one more stop right up ahead. I didn't forget that other beach I mentioned earlier. Little Hunter's Beach, to be exact. While it is marked on the main park map, there's no signage for it on the loop road. And since this is a one-way road, you need to be ready so you don't miss it. Keep an eye out for these two pull-offs on the right, and on the left, this wooden staircase. Park your car and then head down the staircase. It's a little steep, but you're quickly greeted with an amazing view of this unique beach. And what makes it unique? Well, there's no sand. Instead, it's made up of smooth, rounded rocks, which get larger and larger the closer to the shoreline you get. 
it makes walking down here a little tough. But it makes for a really cool view. And sounds as the waves crash over and move these cobblestones around. I recommend visiting closer to lower tide, like I did here back in 2020, when the largest boulders are more visible. Come high tide, they're mostly hidden by the ocean. It's generally a little more secluded down here too, though not the most comfortable beach to lay out on. It's a great spot for stargazing as well. The Milky Way passes right through here on midsummer nights with a new moon. But like I mentioned before, on this trip, I was visiting during a full moon, and while I was a little disappointed I wouldn't get to see the Milky Way, that full moon just so happened to be rising right over Hunter's Beach, out over the ocean. And with a few cruise ships passing through, it made for some pretty incredible shots. It was getting close to the end of my trip though, and we still had Acadia's premier attraction to tackle. Sunrise from the top of Cadillac Mountain. But I needed a break before diving back into the crowds, so I decided to head over to the quieter part of Acadia. The Skudik Peninsula, which we passed by on the Puffin Cruise before. Located about an hour from Mount Desert Island, the Skudik Peninsula is the only part of Acadia found on the mainland. And here, you'll find similar views to those of Mount Desert sea cliffs, coves, and a wooded interior, but with far, far less people. Starting from the visitor center, there's a six mile loop road through this part of the park, with pull-offs along the way for you to stop and explore. From this particular cove, I could see the Winter Harbor Lighthouse again too. And while I was visiting in the afternoon, I bet sunset would be pretty spectacular from here. Continuing on, I decided to take the short gravel road here upwards to Skudik Head, a high point that gives a nice view of the surrounding area, including Mount Desert Island and Cadillac Mountain across the channel. Lastly, I headed over to Skudik Point, a rocky area you can walk out onto for some great ocean views and even more of Mount Desert Island. But it was my last chance to get a reservation for sunrise at Cadillac Mountain. Found on recreation.gov, this can be a difficult one to get. It's very popular. 30% of reservations are released 90 days in advance, and 70% are released two days beforehand, at 10 a.m. Eastern Time sharp. So there I was, set to try again, and I was not successful. Well, that was a bummer. It seemed like I did everything right, but I still couldn't get in. So now what? Well, you can always hike to the top of Cadillac Mountain, in the dark mind you. There's a handful of different trails to the top, but all are pretty strenuous. But you don't need a reservation if you decide to hike up there for sunrise. Luckily, especially for the sake of this video, I actually did sunrise here back in 2020, before the reservation system was in place. And it's also definitely very crowded. I parked my car and got into position. A fog came rolling in off the coast, covering Bar Harbor down below. At first I was worried, but it actually enhanced the scenery. The sun's first rays came creeping up over the horizon making the sky and fog glow in wonderful orange and pink hues. I wasn't sure this was going to be worth the early wake-up call, but man, was it ever. And if you don't manage to snag a reservation, or you don't feel like hiking in the dark, you actually do have some alternatives. First, you do still need a timed entry reservation to visit Cadillac Mountain during the day, but it's much easier to get, and you can generally find them day of. Of course, if you just want to see what it looks like from the top, you can pick any old time and head on up. But if you want some golden hour light, sunset is another great option. So that's exactly what I did on this trip. I paid the $6 for a 7pm entry slot, arrived at the permit check gate, 
followed the twisting road up to the top of Cadillac Mountain. The views really are incredible from up here. There's vantage points of Bar Harbor, the Skudik Peninsula, Otter Cove, and of course, our friend the Beehive. It's a near 360 degree view of Mount Desert Island. And of course, the sunset. While you don't get the sea fog of sunrise, it's still pretty magical, watching it set now over the lakes and forests of Mount Desert Island. Not bad at all. So now, I think it's probably safe to say that Acadia National Park lives up to its name as the crown jewel of the North Atlantic. Until the next time. <laughs>